welcome to our very first science cheer chat with the science cheerleaders. My name is Lisa Morosky, and I'm the National Cheer and Dance Commissioner for Pop Warner Little Scholars. Tonight, we are so very excited to introduce a new adventure with this wonderful team to learn more about their experiences while having a lot of fun and enjoying science activities at the same time. So let's get started. And I'd like to first introduce and welcome Darlene Cavalier. Thank you, Lisa. It's great to be here. I'm Darlene Cavalier with the Science Cheerleaders. These are current and former NFL, NBA, and college cheerleaders who have one other thing in common besides their love of cheerleading and dance. They're all pursuing careers in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. And we've done a lot of really cool things with Pop Warner in the past. Did you know that we together set a new Guinness World Record for the world's largest cheerleading cheer? That was at one of your regional competitions. Now, unfortunately, we lost that record, but we want to get it back again in the future. We've also done some meet and greets and even engaged many of the Pop Warner cheerleaders in a new Science of Cheerleading ebook. You'll see some of your teams represented there doing cheers, science cheers, and even engaged in a real science project where some of your cheerleaders and your football players and your parents and fans helped us by swabbing microbes from shoes and from phones and even from fields and courts. And believe it or not, several of those samples went to the International Space Station where they were evaluated as part of our research project. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Today, I'm here to introduce you to three science cheerleaders who are also co-directors of the organization. We have Samantha, Dr. Hillary, and Dr. Wendy. They're going to talk to you about their experiences in cheerleading and the teams that they've cheered for. And I would say more importantly, all of the important work that they're doing in science and engineering. They'll introduce themselves in just a few minutes. We also have some really fun events and activities that we'll do during this call, which is the first of a monthly series that we're going to be doing with Pop Warner. And we're really excited about that. We'll talk a little bit more about that later too. And by the way, two of the activities will be an actual science cheer led by our science cheerleaders here and an activity to draw a scientist, which is actually way more fun than I just made it sound. Um, you'll have an opportunity to ask us questions live. However, this is our first event, so we're recording this. We'll record all of them, but really we're recording this and we'll share it out. So even if later you watch this and you have some questions, you can just post them on either our Facebook page or the Pop Warner Facebook page, and we can give some contact information so you will know how to reach us later with questions that you might have. So on Zoom, we want to be respectful. We don't want to talk over each other. We don't want to use bad language, of course. And um, we want to just use, you know, polite behavior here. If you do join us live, you'll see that there's a chat window if you're joining us by Zoom. That's where you can post your questions. And this is where we'll be checking um, to see if you've asked any questions there. On the Pop Warner Facebook page and on the Science Cheerleaders Facebook page, we're also streaming this to those pages. So it's live there. So you can hopefully give us some likes or loves and you can ask us some questions there. So we hope you have fun during this event. And I think it's time to meet our Science Cheerleaders. All right, let's see, which science cheerleader are we starting with here? Do you have a preference, Sam, Wendy, or Hillary? All right, how about if we start with Hillary, who can tell us a little bit of uh, the work that she's doing, um, especially as it relates to COVID, since it's super timely too. And tell us about your cheer history too. Thank you, Hillary. Of course, I'm so excited to be here to chat with everyone. My name is Hillary, and I've been working with the Science Cheerleaders for a while now um, because I actually started my cheerleading career at a higher level in college. I cheered for the Colgate University Raiders, and right after college, I went to get my PhD, and I did that at Brown University where I helped coach the Brown University cheerleading team there while I did my doctorate. 
After my doctorate, I went on to a postdoctoral fellowship at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and Harvard Medical School, where I got really involved in cancer research. And I actually was studying in a lab that won the Nobel Prize last year for physiology and medicine. Um, and after that, I more recently moved into a small biotech company that works on cancer therapy as well, where I'm a scientist. And since the COVID-19 pandemic started, I've also been running a COVID testing program with an excellent team at our company to try to detect COVID infections early and help keep everyone safe. And in between all of this, I think you also had a wedding and you helped organize events. So busy life. All that multitasking and all of that time management that you guys are learning in Pop Warner, it comes back in a big way. It does. Thank you for the introduction, Hillary. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about why um, you chose to go into science. And if you can recall, you know, not just what Spark did, but it's a big commitment to pursue that as a professional career too. So tell us a little more about that. Yeah, I, I love science because it is one of the things where every single day, every answer that you get, whether it's what you expected or a total surprise, it changes how you spend the next day. So you're constantly learning and you're constantly trying new things and you get to be really creative but all of that is done in the context of really trying to help the world and help everyone stay healthy. And in my case, cure cancer and cure disease. So that uh, passion and that creativity keeps me excited every single day. And I think that's what keeps me coming back for more degrees and more schooling and more you know, lifetime of learning in this job. Do you remember when you kind of thought about like, hey, I might want to be a scientist someday? It's hard to remember the exact moment. I think it was more of over time, I kept finding myself interested in why things were the way they were. And I would learn things in history classes that told me what things were and how they started. And I would learn things in English classes about how to communicate it. But the one that was most interesting to me was creating that new knowledge and really starting from just a question and having a deliberate way to get an answer to something that maybe no one had ever asked before. So I love that creative outlet. And I, I remember just finding that every question that I got an answer to made me wanna ask more questions. So I followed that, that passion in right into this career. And can you tell us how cheer and dance and STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, fit together for you, how they complement each other? Yeah, I think that one of the most important things in science is to always stay optimistic and positive because it is hard. And the best thing about it is that that one moment when you really feel like you got an answer and you've helped someone or what you're doing is going to lead to a new treatment. And those moments don't come as often as we all would like. And so in cheerleading and dance, you learn to practice and to keep going. And if there's a trick or a stunt or something you can't quite master, if you stay persistent and you keep trying and you keep practicing, you eventually learn and you figure it out. And I think that persistence translates really well into science. And I also think that ability to work as an individual where you're building your best skills because you wanna be the best teammate. You wanna be someone that supports the people around you and makes them more successful. And you want to rely on all of your teammates as much as they rely on you. And I think that's the way that we get things done as best as we can in science. The more we work together and collaborate, the better things are gonna get. And I think that's definitely a lesson that we can all learn and keep in mind uh, and translates really well. Can you tell us about a time that you faced adversity in your career and how you, how you dealt with that? I think that everybody faces adversity a lot more the longer you stay in something challenging. And um, one of the situations that I can remember is, is sort of breaking down the, the stereotypes and barriers around being a woman in science. And it's one of the things that I love most about science cheerleaders is that 
it gives you a whole host of examples and wonderful role models of people who did it and are doing it and are here for you. And we lean on each other just the same way we hope all of Pop Warner will lean on us. And uh, while sometimes you might be the first woman or the first person in your field to ask a question or to try something new, you may be breaking down barriers, but those are the types of things that you want to be the first so that everybody who comes behind you can come with you and you lift us all up together. Okay, can you tell us one of your best cheerleading experiences? Then I'm going to ask you the same for science experiences and then your science cheerleader experiences. Yeah, I, I think one of my best cheerleading experiences was in my first year of college when my, my home team, my Colgate University Raiders, were in the Patriot League championships for football. And it was late in the season and it was upstate New York and it was pretty cold. Uh, and right during our championship game to right towards the end, it started to snow and our team won and everyone was cheering and going mad in the crowd. And it really felt like just this one amazing community. Uh, and I'll hold that feeling with me always. One of your best uh, science experiences? I think the peak of my science career so far was um, last year in December, I got to go to the Nobel Prize proceedings and present the work that I had been doing on kidney cancer um, and how that relates to hypoxia and oxygen sensing, which is um, the discovery that won the Nobel Prize, and to present that work at the Nobel Forum and just see what this you know fundamental discovery from so many years ago had translated into and to talk about how the work that we were doing that built on that was really going to help patients. Uh, it was just an unforgettable experience. I, I lived through your pictures on Facebook. That was so <laughs> exciting to watch. We were so proud of you. And then um, maybe your favorite experience as, as a science cheerleader. I think that my favorite things to do as a science trader is to talk to young people who are, who are just sort of starting to think about science and to help um, communicate that science is part of every single thing that you do, whether you're with your team doing a cheer and you're trying to figure out how to you know, dig deep in your diaphragm and, and cheer from, from deep sound, or if you're trying to land a stunt if you're trying to get a new twist down and understand how does that how does that physics help how does that snap help um, and to just keep all of that um, in context where you're you're doing science every single day and as you do your cheerleading career you're going to continue and to help make that connection is one of my favorite things I hope that that's something that we bring out tonight and I think you actually just answered my last question which is one thing you hope the audience learns from today's chat. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I, I hope that you all realize that science and technology and engineering and math, they're all things that you're already doing. They're not these scary, untouchable fields. In fact, they're, they're integral to everything you're doing. And so embracing that and letting it work for you is one of the best things you can do. That was awesome, Hillary. Thank you so much. And if any uh, cheerleaders are watching this, please feel free to uh, post comments on the Facebook pages or you can email us with that. You can go to sciencecheerleaders.org and you'll find some contact um, email addresses there too. So thank you, Hillary. We'll move on to Sam now. Hey, Sam. Hey. Similar questions. If you can tell us a little bit about your cheer and your science background and why you chose engineering. So my background is in engineering, and when I was studying to be an engineer in college at Arizona State, I cheered for the Arizona Cardinals. So I was with the Cardinals for two seasons, and it was in my last two years of college, which is usually when you kind of hunker down in those really heavy engineering courses, but I really loved it. I chose engineering because I'm very interested in how things work. So I was that kid that liked to break apart the toys, break apart the phones, see what's inside. I was always curious why when I click on a button on my computer, why does it, how does it know where to take me? So engineering was a very natural fit, um, but I didn't always know that. I actually 
didn't even know what that was called or what it meant until I was a lot older in high school and was able to read about it and figure out, oh, I guess I want to be an engineer because I like that stuff. So I definitely wish someone had told me sooner what engineering actually means um, because that's really how I connected with it and found it. That, that's a good background. And I think you won an award when you were at ASU too, an engineering award. Yeah. I did. Um, so one of my proud achievements there is I was very unhappy with just the regular um, industrial mechanical engineering program. And there were so many other courses that I wanted to take that just couldn't fit in. I already had a very full schedule. So I worked with the admin to make a brand new degree program. And I was the first graduating class of that degree program and then was able to graduate as the outstanding senior for that particular degree. Which is awesome. And I, I said ASU, which is Arizona State University. So, and Sam and I have two things in common. We are big Eagles fans from Philadelphia and I work at Arizona State University and Sam went to ASU. So Sam, could you tell us a little bit about how cheer and engineering converge for you? They totally converge. Um, a lot of people think of engineers and they think of, you know, these nerdy kids with no friends in a dark corner coding on your computer. And that's just not reality. I'm sure they're out there, but none of the ones I've met are like that at all. Uh, engineering really requires teamwork and you learn that so much through cheer and dance. I learned how to work with other people, how to talk with other people when you have questions or need help, or really if you just have suggestions and wanna make improvements. So that teamwork is definitely one of the best things that I was able to transfer over. And can you tell us about a time you faced adversity as an engineer? Yeah, I mean, no one is immune from this at all. There have been plenty of times when I was a cheerleader, I'm in my uniform at an appearance meeting fans and they ask you what you do. And I say, oh, I'm studying to be an engineer. And they're like, oh, that's not possible. Actually I am though. And they just don't believe you and they don't believe that you can do both things. And the reverse is also true. I, I love dresses and pink and makeup and things like that. And there are so many people saying, oh, well, you probably have to cut your hair or you should probably wear a black suit to the interview. And my response was, if they don't like me in my pink suit or my dress, then I don't wanna be with those people. And I've been very fortunate to be able to weed, weed those out and find you know, people to work with that really appreciate that. But you know, there are people who just disagree with it and you kind of just have to stand up for yourself. Great examples. Nobody's 100% anything. We're all a little bit of everything. So yeah. challenging stereotypes can be fun. So keep on keeping at it. Can you tell us a little bit about why science cheerleaders is important to you? It's so important to me. One of my favorite things to do is to inspire young women. I had such a fortunate experience being able to be a cheerleader and an engineer. And I think the barrier to a lot of young girls wanting to do anything in STEM is they don't think they can do anything else. And so I just really want to be that example. I want to share not only my stories, but all of my colleagues' stories of look at all of these ways that you can still do science or still do engineering, and then also the things you love. So I just love having that opportunity to share that with the world. Okay, your best cheer experience, your best engineering experience. And then also I did not get a chance to ask you what a typical day is like, what you do in your day job too. Yeah, so I'll start with my best cheer experience. And I have to pick two just because I can never decide. Um, the first one, which I think a lot of cheerleaders might have the same answer is the very first game as a professional cheerleader running out of the tunnel you just, everything goes black. You forget about everything. You forget your dance, but magically it'll happen. Um, and you just see all the fans and you breathe in the air and it's just really surreal. And it was so cool. 
Um, but my second favorite was I actually accidentally got stranded on an appearance trip by myself. So I traveled to Washington and I was so scared um, because I'm not used to being that outgoing and I had to do it all by myself. And I visited a military base and they just completely brought me in as their family. It was so incredible. They were thankful that I was there, but I was thankful that they let me be there because they were just so nice. Um, and I just totally thank them for their service. Um, I would say my best engineering experience, I don't have like a big event that has ever happened, but my most memorable moments are when I push the boundaries. So I have a day job, I have a role that I'm supposed to do. And my favorite thing is when I kind of break that. So I love coming up with a new way to do things better. And I usually have um, support from my management to go try something new. So I love being able to, you know, call my boss and say, hey, I think we should try this. And then being able to try that and be the first one to try it. So that's really exciting for me. You've also done a good job. You definitely have employers who value you, Sam, because you've been able to bring different levels of sponsorships um, and in-kind donations, even now from Cisco and so forth. So that must feel good too, to have your company support you that way. Yeah, it feels so good. And it, a lot of that goes back to, you know, when you're interviewing, you're also choosing the company that you're working for. You're choosing them to accept you and what you want to bring to the table as well. And I've been fortunate you know, I'm an engineer, but I have done more than just one thing. I've worked with, you know, Wi-Fi technology. I worked in entertainment and video streaming apps, and now I'm working in networking equipment. So it's all very different, and I still get to use the same skills every time. All right, Sam. Thank you. And Sam was largely responsible for our new website. Hillary does a lot of the event appearances and recruiting from the NFL and NBA team. So this is how our team works together. And any other points, Sam, before we toss it to Wendy? Um, just that I hope you all learn that you can still dance and cheer or be a football player, whatever you want to be, and then still love science just as much as I do. Great. Thank you, Sam. All right, Wendy, over to you. Can you tell us about your cheer and your STEM backgrounds? Yeah, um, so I am a biomedical engineer in my day job, I engineer cartilage. So cartilage is the slippery shock absorber that's in all of your joints. And I primarily work on the knee. So if you're a cheerleader or a cheer coach, maybe you have dealt with some knee pain in the past. Um, but I try to engineer cartilage to replace injured cartilage so that we can avoid those knee problems and hopefully avoid getting knee replacements later in life. Uh, my undergrad degree is in biomedical engineering from the Georgia Institute of Technology. And then I did my PhD in biomedical engineering at UC Davis. And now I'm a postdoc at UC Irvine. And then my cheer experience, when I was in college, I was on my dance team in college my last year in college, I cheered for the Atlanta Falcons. Go Falcons. And then um, when I moved to California for graduate school, I cheered one year for the Sacramento Kings, which is an NBA team. And then another four years for the then Oakland Raiders, now Las Vegas Raiders, um, because I missed football so much. Yeah, so unique that uh, Wendy cheered for NBA and NFL in addition to college while pursuing her PhD. <laughs> Makes me tired. <laughs> <laughs> well, because I'm from Pennsylvania too, you know, like you and yeah. So cheer, my cheer family was my family away from home. And that's why I never gave it up because everywhere I moved, I wanted that like immediate family and the immediate friends I had through the team. That is so true. I think that all the cheerleaders who listen to this can absolutely recognize that feeling too, all through. And I, I failed to mention that I cheered pretty much my whole life, all the way through college at Temple University and then to um, uh, the NBA. I cheered for the 76ers. Well, my whole life up until that point. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so true. It's just such an easy way to 
meet like a family, right? Mm -hmm. You spend a lot of time together. You work really hard. A lot of what Hillary was getting at too, that sense of teamwork and persistence and getting through things together um, matters a lot. So that's part of what we do with science cheerleaders is not to try to make you not be a cheerleader and become a scientist. It's, we know all of those amazing factors and those attributes that make you a good cheerleader will make you an amazing scientist and engineer if that's what you want to do. Mm -hmm. But later on in this episode, we'll also tell you all the ways you can still dabble in science and engineering without having to know what you want to be, or with even like having to know that you have to go to college for that. So we'll get to that a little later. We're going to continue with Wendy here. So um, Wendy, why did you choose STEM? And then how did you actually whittle down your interest into like repairing cartilage? I have always been really interested in the way the body works. I think part of that is because I've always been super active my whole life. I was a figure skater and did martial arts and was dancing all along the way. And I just was always super interested in how, how is the heart moving blood around my body, which we'll actually talk about later, but how are my muscles working? How is this muscle memory that's allowing me to perform this routine? And I'm not even thinking about it. Like, how does that happen? I was always just fascinated by it. And the cartilage is what has always been really unique to me. And that comes from literally eating dinner with my family, eating chicken, you know, you have the chicken and the bone, and then you have this crunchy piece of white stuff at the end of the chicken bone. And it's so unique compared to everything else around it. That was like, I have to know more about this. I don't know anything right now, but this is fascinating to me. Oh boy. Right. Chicken cartilage. <laughs> I know it's probably the most random like origin story of like how any of us got interested in science, but it was, you know, something that I didn't understand and that I wanted to learn more about. And then as I got a little bit older, I realized I didn't want to just study the way the body worked and just know how things happened. I wanted to also create things that helped people. And that's why I'm in biomedical engineering. So as a biomedical engineer, we engineer things that help the medical field. So that's medical devices for doctors during surgery or big MRI or x-ray machines to help doctors see inside patients better, or in my case, engineering literal like body tissues to help replace damaged pieces of body. It's, I mean, really amazing. And I think it's our future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, you're on my screen, you're right between Sam and Hillary, and even professionally, you're between Sam and Hillary with the medical and the engineering and bringing that together. Um, also, just following up on that part about the cartilage too, can you also share some examples of how your work can help people from um, service members to possibly even astronauts? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think we all know somebody with a cartilage injury probably. You know, maybe you know a grandparent um, that has a hip replacement or a knee replacement, or your cheer or dance coach says, oh man, I can't do that, my knee hurts today, something like that. Um, a lot of that comes from your cartilage because it doesn't heal. You know, our bones heal, our skin heals, but cartilage doesn't. So if I can create an implant to help replace that damaged piece of cartilage, and make it like brand new, then those people won't have pain anymore. They'll be able to continue cheering or running or whatever they wanna do and leave more active lives. Um, and it, that, that's also super, super important, not just for athletes, but everyday people, like I said, your grandparents walking up the stairs or military service members who have experienced trauma in combat or like you said, astronauts in space, you know, we're, we're living longer, you know, thanks to Hillary and people like her who are curing us of cancer, we're living longer, but our joints aren't catching up. Um, so that's what I'm trying to do is help our joints catch up to the rest of our bodies. We are going to talk a little bit about the astronaut connection now too. Um, Hillary was one of the principal investigators of a research project that we did with Pop Warner cheerleaders with researchers at UC Davis and with um, federal labs, government labs, and even with NASA. Do you want to um, 
talk to us and remind us about Project Mercury, what the goals of the project were, how the science cheerleaders were involved, what your specific role was, including the training video for the, for the astronauts. Yeah, so Project Mercury was a microbial science experiment in space, basically. Um, it stands for Microbial Ecology Research Connecting Citizen and University Researchers on the International Space Station. That's why we abbreviate it to Project Mercury. Um, but we had citizen scientists and professional cheerleaders from all over the country collect microbe samples from high touch surfaces like keyboards and computer mice or your cell phones, the bottom of your shoes. And we sent 48 of those microbes into space to measure how they grew in space compared to how they grew on the earth. And we had a microbial playoff to put it in a sports contest, um, sports context. So like the, the one that grew the fastest or grew the most overall, um, things like that. And I felt very lucky that I was part of the project and helped write the grant that got us the funding to do the project, helped collect some of the samples. And then we actually went to the Johnson Space Center and I helped film a training video for the astronauts who also collected microbes from the same high touch surfaces like computer keyboards inside the International Space Station. And then they sent the samples back down to earth where we analyzed that data. Yeah, and we're gonna talk about the outcomes briefly. So I had not known before this project how things get to the International Space Station. The fact that you can see the International Space Station with your naked eye. Sometimes it might look like Mars, it's a little orangey, but it orbits overhead kind of all the time. But um, so there's an ISS tracker. So if you ever wanted to see the International Space Station flying overhead and impress your friends, you can do that with an app that's there. Um, so we went to Kennedy Space Center. They had our samples, your samples from Pop Warner. In fact, one, I can't remember where she was, but it was one of the youth Pop Warner cheerleaders from the LA area who was responsible and credited with basically discovering a new species of a microbe, which is basically- it was the, the Pop Warner team in Coronado in um, basically like South San Diego discovered a brand new species of microbe. Yeah, like you said. That team, Lisa, I don't know if you know this, is actually published in peer-reviewed journals for discovering this. So we go down to Kennedy Space Center and we watch SpaceX carry our payload to space. And then it joins up with, it kind of catches up with the orbit and then joins up with the International Space Station. A robotic arm delivers our space experiment, your space experiment. Astronauts inside accept it lock the door, do the experiment like Wendy just um, described. And then when they're finished, I can't remember how long it was there, five days, maybe two weeks, put it back out into something, a capsule. That part goes into the ocean, just drops into the ocean. And then they have people retrieve the experiments from there. And so part of the reason why we wanted to, well, actually, why don't you describe why we wanted to do this experiment, why it matters what's growing on the International Space Station and why the growth rate comparisons matter. And can you just describe what a microbe is too? Yeah, so a microbe is pretty much anything microscopic. Um, we looked specifically at bacteria and there's sort of a misconception that bacteria and microbes are really scary. And the truth is that 99.999% of them are completely harmless or even beneficial. You know, you have microbes that live on your skin that help maintain the health of your body. So they're completely not harmless, but we're talking about going to Mars, going back to the moon, and then eventually going to Mars and even to other planets. And we really need to understand the way these microbes respond to those very strange environments, microgravity, higher radiation, that's environments that are very different than Earth. And so this project helped sort of dip our toe in the water and helped us understand how some of those things might change. And it's all, it's not necessarily scary, you know, like science fiction might have you think like, oh my gosh, this bacteria is gonna take over the space station. A lot of them didn't change actually, but these are questions that we have to ask so that we can know if we are gonna go to Mars. Mm -hmm. Which takes a very long time to get there. You really wanna know what's traveling with you if you're mm -hmm. signing up to go to Mars. 
Okay. Um, can you tell us about a time when you faced adversity? Yeah. So I think my sort of struggles were more internal than maybe a lot of other people's. I think there wasn't one particular person that was like, you can't do science because you're a dancer or you have to pick or something like that. But I was very aware of the stereotypes and it really weighed heavily on me. So I was sort of the one telling myself that I couldn't do both. And it wasn't even until my second year of college where I interned with a female medical doctor who had gone to my college. She was the feature twirler while she was in college. She was a chemical engineering degree, went on to medical school and was crowned Miss Georgia while she was in medical school. And working with her just showed me living proof that you can do anything you set your mind to. Like, I finally realized that I didn't have to choose. And here was proof that somebody could do something very similar to what I wanted to do and be successful at it. And it was just really a confidence boost. And you could see that reflected in my grades. Immediately, my grades went up. I started seeking research opportunities. So I worked in a lab as an undergrad. And I just was really unapologetic about pursuing what I wanted to do with my life. And that was really a turning point. And so that mentorship is really what I wanna like give forward to other people and why science cheerleaders are so important to me. I want to help be that mentor for other people and show them that they can do whatever they want to do. That was perfect, Wendy. I didn't even have to ask the last question, which was what's one thing you hope the audience learns from today? So that was a great summary, unless you want to add anything else to that. Nope, that was it. Just you can pursue whatever you want to, whether that's science, engineering, cheering, dancing, golfing, singing, yeah. you know, whatever. The, the sky is the limit, literally. All of the above. All right, Wendy, do you want to take us into the heart of cheer activity? Yeah. So we are going to do, let me share... So we're going to do a little cheer and science activity all in one. Um, so we developed this activity called the heart of cheer, and it's going to teach you about heart physiology and heart function and also cheerleading. Okay, so let's jump right in. We're going to learn a little bit about the heart. I promise it's not going to be like online school, which is, I'm sure, so incredibly boring. We're going to get up and move, but, you know, we just have to know what the heart does first. So the heart is a muscle. It's just like every other muscle in your body, just like your bicep. And it acts like a giant pump to help move the blood around your body. It's located in the middle of your chest and just a little bit to the left. And if you make a fist, it's right about the size of your fist. So it's right in your, your chest between your lungs. So now we're gonna talk about the parts of the heart. I know that heart diagram has a lot of crazy words on it, but don't worry about that, I'll walk you through it. So first of all, the heart has four chambers. Uh, there's two atria, each one is called an atrium, and then plural, they're atria, and two ventricles. So in this diagram, you can see the right atrium and the left atrium and then the right ventricle and the left ventricle. So atria are on the top and ventricles are on the bottom. Each chamber, so each atrium and ventricle is separated by a one-way valve right here and right here. And that's to make sure that your blood only flows one way through the heart. That's super important. And then you have arteries, veins, and capillaries that go all throughout your body to help move the blood from your heart and lungs to the body. So for example, you have this pulmonary artery right here and this aorta. Those arteries carry blood away from the heart to your body, to your muscles, your legs, as you're working out, as you're cheerleading. And then your veins, so for example, this, these pulmonary veins right here, they carry blood back from your body to your heart. See, it wasn't that hard, just a lot of fancy words. 
Okay, so how does the heart work? How Actually, does all this come together? Go back one slide, yeah. and so the aorta goes, carries uh, blood in or out. So the aorta. I don't mean to put you on the spot here. No, that's okay. So you I have um, so your pulmonary in. artery here and your aorta. Those carry blood away from your heart. Okay, that's easy with the A's. Yeah, so I remember that arteries away okay. and veins is just right. the two. Yeah, arteries <laughs> away. So with each heartbeat, with each contraction of your heart, your heart performs this sort of like choreographed dance and cheer routine, sort of like we do, to keep the blood moving through your body. And so we're going to go through a list of steps to show exactly what the heart does in what order. So in step one, over here, you can see this little diagram. Your heart relaxes and blood fills both atria from your body and from your lungs. So over here, you get blood from your body. And then over here, you get blood from your lungs that fills both of those atria. Then as the atria squeeze or contract, um, that pumps the blood from those chambers into the ventricles down at the bottom. Then in step three, as those ventricles contract, it sends the blood to your lungs to pick up oxygen, in this case, or out to the body to feed oxygen and nutrients to your muscles that you're using. And then in step four, that blood that contains oxygen is pumped through your body all the way back to your heart. And the whole cycle repeats the process. So your heart is just a really big, complicated pump to send blood to your lungs to get oxygen and then to your body to deliver the oxygen and then blood that doesn't have oxygen anymore because it's in your muscles back to your heart to get more oxygen and circulate through your body. So you can measure a heartbeat. I'm sure at the doctor, you've had somebody put a stethoscope on you and that's a way to listen to it. But another way that you can do it is just by placing your fingers on your neck. So if you're at home, try doing this. You can feel these big sort of muscles on either side of your neck. And if you go slightly forward from that, there's like a little kind of crevice. And then if you're just quiet and calm, you can feel like a little pulsing. Each one of those is a heartbeat. So your heart beats between 50 and 100 times a minute if you're at rest, sometimes more if you're active. So let's try to measure that right now. Can Darlene, can you time us for 30 seconds? So sure. if you're out there, if you're out there um, in Facebook land, count the number of pulses you feel for this 30 okay. seconds that Darlene is going to tell us. Ready? Go. Time. Okay, so what did you guys get? So that was for 30 seconds, so double it so you can get your heart rate in a minute. I was at 40, so my heart rate is 80 beats per minute because I'm excited and I was talking. What about you guys? I got 32, so my beats per minute would be 64. 38, so 76. Nice. Cool. So we're all in the normal range. I'm a little bit higher because I'm excited and talking. What did you get, Lisa? I was 35. So I am breathing. Yes, I'm doing well. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay. So like I said, during heartbeat, your heart closes off those different chambers to help push the blood through the other chambers and back into the body. 
And like I said, your heart beats 50 to 100 times a minute. And we just measured our resting heart rate. So when we are cheering or dancing or running or talking, what do you think happens to our heart rate? Does it go up or down? Yeah, it goes up. So let's do a cheer and try to prove this. So if you guys are familiar with our Science of eBook, uh, Science of Cheerleading eBook, this is something that's available for free online and you can download and it literally tells you the science of cheerleading and it has a bunch of cheerleading cheers in it. Um, but I modified one to be about heart function. So I'm going to teach you that cheer really fast and then we're going to do it a few times and retake our heart rates. So the words go bigger, better, faster, longer. Got to make the heartbeat stronger. Bigger, better, faster, longer. Move the blood around your body. We're going to say that three times and then finish it off with go science. And if anybody wants to get up and move, I have some moves for you. Or if you're sitting down, you can do it just sitting. Let me move my chair out of the way. So if you want to stand and move around, you're going to go bigger, better, faster, stronger. Got to make the heartbeat stronger. So that's just right, left, right, left, run in place, swoop, and high V. And then you're just going to do the same thing for the second verse. Bigger, better, faster, longer, move the blood around your body. Awesome. And then if you're sitting and you don't want to get up totally fine, you can just do the arms. Bigger, better, faster, longer. Gotta make the heart beat stronger. So I'm stamping my feet when I'm doing that. And then exactly the same thing for the second verse. And then we're going to finish it off with a go science. Are we ready? Ready. Let me grab my palms, fully prepared. All right, let's start. Bigger, better, faster, longer. Gotta make the heart beat stronger. Bigger, better, faster, longer. Move the blood around your body. Bigger, better, Faster, longer, gotta make the heart beat stronger. Bigger, better, faster, longer, move the blood around your body. One more time. Bigger, better, faster, longer, gotta make the heart beat stronger. Bigger, better, faster, longer, move the blood around your body. Go science! science. Yay, okay. Yay. We need a timer. Take your heartbeat again. Let's do it again. Okay, so that was 30 seconds and I got like 75 in 30 seconds. So what is that? 150? Ooh. Yeah. What did you guys get? I got 90. I was up to 41, so 82 beats per minute. <sighs> All that talking and running. <laughs> it makes a big difference when you're talking. Yeah, it really does. Okay. Ooh, so. That was fun, Wendy. That was Yeah. Fun. Hold on, I gotta catch my breath. That was about the only exercise I had today. So, and I did not even talk and do it at the same time. That was great. Um, I don't know that we have any questions coming. Is there, any, is there anything you wanna add to that activity, Wendy? Yeah, I just wanted to talk about why your heart rate goes up really fast yeah. and then why do we care about the heart? 
Um, so just to wrap it up, when your body is more active, your muscles and everything needs more oxygen and more nutrients because you're so active. So your heart beats faster to deliver more blood and more oxygen to the muscles and the parts of your body that you're using. As you can tell, we're out of breath. And then maybe Sam and Hillary can just tell us why we would care about the heart. Sam, do you, why do we care about the heart? Why do we care about any of this? So actually athletes and coaches really care about your heart and how healthy your heart is. Uh, for instance, you could be playing or cheering at a game for hours and hours and hours. You might not see it, but at least in the NFL, the cheerleaders are doing full dances every time the players stop. So in between every play, they have to dance. And it takes a lot of oxygen, a lot of heart health to make sure you can keep going without getting too tired. So coaches will help athletes condition their bodies so that their heart rates don't get too high because um, that can be very dangerous, um, but also so their oxygen can keep going to their muscles that's needed while they're cheering or while they're playing. And then I mean, researchers like Hillary and I care about the heart because sometimes you, your heart doesn't work properly and you need a pacemaker. And um, a pacemaker, for example, is a medical device that a biomedical engineer can create to help control your heartbeat and make sure that it continues beating steady to continue delivering all that stuff to your body. Scientists are working all the time to try to understand the different diseases and disorders that can harm your heart's function and to try to work on how to fix them and how to cure them to make sure that you can live a long and happy life. Not to preach to all of our young cheerleaders out there, but obviously things that will impede that would be smoking, vaping, doing things that you know are going to hurt you. And so now you see your heart is really important. I didn't mean to jump in with the PSA ladies, but you know, these girls are getting at that age where can't do it. <laughs> keep yeah. your heart and lungs healthy. You need them, especially if you want to keep cheering, right? So I can't help it. That's the mom in me. I had teenagers. So I know it, but okay. Um, Wendy, we also have a kit, mm -hmm. right? You guys created a kit around some of these activities too. And yeah. So we have um, a full, we call them side cheer kits that has all of the, the information that we went over about heart function. And, and then the activity we just did, all of that packaged up in a really nice kit. And then we also have a binary computer programming kit, which maybe we will go over those activities at another session. Yeah, already we're coming down to the wire here. Um, if there aren't any other comments, maybe we'll start to wrap things up here. All right. I, so, I think on the um, Pop Warner side, you're getting a lot of compliments um, Millie Kimmins shout out was these ladies are so impressive. Um, the Pacific Northwest region said, yay, UC Davis. Aww. <laughs> um, there's Jane said, super cool. And just everybody's just thrilled to participate with you tonight. Oh, great. I'm glad that so many people are watching. Yes. That's great. That's awesome. And just as a reminder, we're here to support the Pop Warner cheerleaders in particular. If you have any questions about STEM careers or, or cheerleading, um, just, just let us know. Mm -hmm. So um, some of the activities that we talked about, like the one that we, where we sent the microbes to the International Space Station, that's called citizen science. And you'll hear us talk about that from time to time. That, doesn't, that just means that everybody is entitled to be part of science. You don't have to have a degree of any type, certainly not a science degree, although we want to encourage you all to consider science careers, but I did not get a science degree when I went to college. Um, and I, here I am. I founded the organization um, because I care about science and I like doing science, but I do it in my spare time. That's citizen science. And as it turns out, thousands of scientists and researchers actually need your help collecting data, making observations about maybe the weather is changing around you and buds are bursting a little bit earlier than before. Maybe you're noticing that Lots and lots of different types of migratory species of, of birds or pollinators are 
um, in your garden or no longer in your garden. These observations are really important to science. So many other ways that you can get involved in science and that's almost any age level, your parents for sure, um, and anytime, anywhere. So that's citizen science and we do that through our sister organization, which is SciStarter. That's thousands of projects available to you to get involved in. So that's that term and that's what this organization is. And then we want to talk a little bit about our activity of uh, drawing a scientist. This is something we're going to do every month where we'll invite you to draw a scientist. There's no right or wrong um, way to do this either. It's just a fun way to engage. You can post them, you can share them on any of the social media channels that we have here on the screen. And it's actually it'd be fun if um, maybe Wendy and Hillary and Sam have drawn a scientist. And if you have, can you hold it up to the screen? We can take a look. And do you want to tell us what's on there, Wendy? You're the first sure. one. So I love space and everything about going to the moon. So my, my scientist is a cheerleader astronaut. And you can see my red hair floating in my space helmet. That reminds me of the patch that we had for uh, Project Mercury, where we actually had a science cheerleader in space on, a, on an official patch. Now, I don't know if we can see Sam and Hillary's with the screen share. Let's see, you might need to take Let me off. take my screen here, Tom. All right, can we see? Hillary, do you wanna tell us what yours is? And then Sam? Yeah, this is, this is my scientist who is a multitasker like me. So you've got your science cheerleader pom-pom in one hand and your flask of something that probably shouldn't be smoking in the other hand. But <laughs> science is trial and error. We try and try again. And the molecule over here floating by my head is what caffeine looks like on the structural level, which is what keeps me going between trying to cure cancer and trying to help COVID. <laughs> That's awesome. And Sam. So my scientist, obviously I chose the T and E in STEM. Um, she is still in her little dress working on the computer. Uh, most of my work is on a computer, but that's how I get to connect with everyone. So that's what my scientist is doing. And they all look happy. Yeah. <laughs> what neat to see. So don't forget, do a drawing of a scientist, tag us on any of these social media channels at the side cheers, plural there. So that'd be cool. And we have some prizes too. We're gonna kind of select some. We don't have any set criteria, pretty informal. We just wanna have fun. Um, and then when you tag us, you also obviously give us rights to repost them on things too. So you're already putting it out there. We're just going to help more people see your fantastic drawings there. So the science cheerleaders will be hosting these types of live events every month in collaboration with Pop Warner. Um, our next event, please mark your calendars, is November 17th. That's 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 4 p.m. Pacific Time. And it will be with Wendy's old team, the Atlanta Falcons. Wendy will be your host and moderator. And then in the next few months, you'll meet uh, cheerleaders from the New England Patriots and from the San Francisco 49ers and probably from our friends in Phoenix and Arizona, Sam's old team too. So each month we'll have another um, team that joins us here and you'll uh, be hosted by one of the science cheerleaders that you see on screen now. Check the Pop Warner Cheer and Dance Facebook page for details, as well as the Science Cheerleaders website, that's sciencecheerleaders.org, and our Facebook page at The Side Cheers. I think that might be everything. It's exactly eight o'clock, unless there's some questions from the Facebook page. I think we can probably wrap it up. And I, I vote that next month, we have a little background music too. <laughs> This was great. That's Thank it. you, everyone. That's great. Thank you for joining us tonight. Everyone at Pop Warner loved every minute of this. It's all great and uh, excited comments on the Facebook page. So we're looking forward to Tuesday, November 17th for our second science chat. But thank you, ladies. You're, um, it's a pleasure to participate with you and, and learn your backgrounds. You're so inspiring. And um, our cheerleaders and dancers are going to be thrilled to listen to this over and over again. And um, we hope everybody participates in the science, uh, not only working on the cheer, but also in drawing a scientist. That's so awesome. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to all of our viewers for joining us tonight. 
uh, thank you. And, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. And Lisa, before we close it out, why don't you join us in one final go science cheer? All right, let's do it. Three, two, one. Go, go, go science. Science. Bye everyone. Good Thanks night, again. everyone. Thank you.